Hey there, Lincoln Riffers, and welcome. Give a warm, warm worldwide welcome to the inspiration to the inspirations, the man we all love to love, <laughs> the man we all love to um, secretly envy and not so secretly envy, Mr. Frank Gambale. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was quite the introduction. Thanks, Asa. Yes, I, mean, I meant every word. Thank you. Yes, uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I guess the, the, question, the question everyone would like to know, because when I, when I interview, well, my, my idols, um, I feel incredibly lucky just to be talking to you. So it's... Um, I usually start with backgrounds and how did you get into guitar? Well, who, who are your inspirations? But I, I think that what people really want to know is how did you come up with all those crazy ideas? How, how did you come up with all those, all those crazy techniques and crazy m melodies? And well, let's, let's save the Gambale tuning for later, but where, where is this all coming from? Where, where is this all coming from? Oh. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's all experimentation, um, you know, uh, searching and finding. Um, to me, back when I was coming up, uh, you know, I started guitar very young at like seven years old or six years old. So I had a good head, head start. I was already, you know, developing sweep picking technique at about 13. I was already going, well, it doesn't make sense to go up and down, up and down all the time. Sometimes you want to just go across the strings with a single stroke. It just seemed logical to me. And, um, and I just kept evolving it and evolving it um, over the years. And, you know, I was doing a lot of transcribing as a young man. I, I really listened and copped a lot of solos and learned a lot of songs. And, you know, when you're listening to great improvisers, you can, can't help but be inspired by what you're hearing. Who were your, uh, your inspirations when you were growing up? Uh, well, you know, I discovered uh, Mike Brecker, for example, uh, one of the greatest saxophonists ever. Yeah. Uh, you know, his solos always used to thrill me. <laughs> you know, I was just going... Gosh, ridiculous, crazy, uh, inventive, powerful. Um, it had all this incredible momentum and energy and intellect. And so I was deeply into Mike Brecker for a long time and I transcribed a lot of his solos. And man, let me tell you, they're not easy on the guitar. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Saxophone has this uh, little switch on the back, you know, they've got their fingers pretty much in the same positions. They move a little bit, you know, but they have an octave switch. They just have to go ee, ee, <laughs> and they're in a different octave, same fingering. They're not moving anywhere, which meant, you know, their arpeggios were really easy by, you know, well, easy, you know, for their instrument. Uh, whereas for guitar, you know, skipping, you know, going two octaves was hard. And so I really had to develop, you know, a way to play a, a page of, you know, a lot of skipping right across the strings and You know, these arpeggios are not easy. I had to find a way to finger them, you know, and I, I always say this with guitar, you know, the beautiful thing is we have all these same notes everywhere. Uh, the same note, all this overlapping. So this is beautiful, you know, it's not like piano. You've got, if you want this E on a piano, you've got one place to play it and that's all. Right. right. You don't have a choice if you want to play that note, but we do. And, you know, guitar players get into all of a befuffle about, you know, oh my God, it's too complicated. It's this matrix, you know, it's this crazy labyrinth of possibilities. But I see that as a tremendous advantage on the guitar. Right. The very right. fact that we can, if instead of going, which is traditional, you can go, or you can go, or you can go, 
or or there's so many ways to play the same thing and and you know i was always going well maybe there's an easier way this is tradition and it's beautiful how typical minor pentatonic but hey maybe uh, this just rolls up and it's a bizarre way to play it but can you play can you play it slowly for us that, that was slow <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> uh, uh you know starting here instead of which is just straight up pentatonic right i come across three strings there i can right. do a single picking stroke right and then three notes on this string and then up, and those two here up 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 down up up down mm -hmm. so i can do a one two three four five six seven notes in one two three four strokes you know the the logic is clear you know this technique is phenomenal uh i didn't come at it from the technical aspect though you know for me music comes first always 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 music you know and you can practice things that are really hard that are beautiful and interesting that require a huge amount of technique to be able to play it right so i always came at it from that angle or if i was trying to play a chick Corea lick or a or a michael brecker lick i had to find other i have had to refinger and sort out a way that would enable me Even if I gained a single stroke across two strings, you know, that would help me keep the speed and, and make it that much easier, yes. you know? So uh, I was, I always describe myself as water running downhill. Hmm. You know, it always seeks the easiest path. I mean, guitar is hard enough already. You know, we right. don't need to make it any harder than it is. I'm always going to find the easiest way to play something, not out of laziness, but out of efficiency, right? Being efficient and being, uh, you know, finding the simplest, most effective way to play something. And that's, I did that over and over and over with the sweeping technique and it created a monster. Uh, yep, you said mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and the freedom it allows you Uh, I mean, of course, I still play alternate because you can't. If you have to have one more than more than one note on a string, you have to alternate to some degree, even if the last note is going in the direction you want. So you still have to have a good alternate. But that it's, you know, when I go off onto the sweep, I'm, I'm going across the strings. But when I'm on a single string, I have to have to alternate. But when I'm playing slow, I play like anybody. But it's that extra sixth, fifth gear. That, you know, just is relaxed, you know, it's not, it's, it's, there's no pressure. I don't feel the pressure, of, you know, having to play really fast when I want to play a fast phrase. It's just as relaxed as the rest of it, you know, that's hard to achieve, you know, it takes a lot of years to get to that comfort level, you know, <laughs> yeah. and having the facility when you need it, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of, um, It's a little bit it's a little bit ironic because um this is your technique is maybe one of the most advanced techniques um other than let's say steve morse's uh <laughs> his arpeggios his alternating arpeggios maybe yeah, I don't know how he does it yeah i, I don't <laughs> think he himself knows but yours might be the most advanced electric guitar technique um anyone you know had ever achieved but The, oh, there are many, but yes, it's but certainly up there. I'd, I'd say, you know. But, but you're but you're saying that the ultimate goal was relaxation and playing in a relaxed and easy manner. So that's right at any speed. Yeah, 
you know, whether it's slow or fast, you know, uh, relaxed, efficient. And look, you know, playing fast sometimes feels like a barrier for a lot of people, you know, getting past that point to where you can really express yourself freely. You know, to me, I, I want to be in that zone when I'm playing, when I'm improvising. I don't want to think of the physicality of the instrument. I need to get beyond the physical, physical limitations that this instrument presents for many people. Yes. And I really think the sweep picking technique, my Gambali sweep picking technique, I call it now, um, really helped me go beyond the normal physical limitations uh, to, to free me up to play however I, I wanted to play with, you know, it's not the cure-all and end-all of everything. You know, there's a million techniques on guitar. Yeah. Not a million, but, you know, people tap or hammer on. There's a lot of ways to play the instrument. But, you know, I'd say the sweep picking technique is the most efficient by far uh, picking technique, if you're going to pick everything. You know? Yeah. You know, whether you're alternate picking or sweet picking, it doesn't matter. If you're expressing yourself freely and how you want to express yourself, I don't care if you play with your nose. You know? <laughs> your guitar, your guitar, your music, your music sometimes sounds bordering on on keyboard or saxophone or, or saxophone qualities. Um, it, it sometimes borders. It doesn't even sound like guitar anymore. It, the way that your notes flow into one another. Yeah. Uh, it's it's definitely fluid. It takes, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's it's not alternate picking. It doesn't sound like alternate picking. But if I go. Yeah. How can you tell that that's not alternate? Yeah. I mute it a little bit, you know, because it's got every bit of the attack. Every time I go across the strings, that was sweeping, you know. That to me sounds as alternate as anything else, you know. Yeah. So people say it sounds different. Yes, it sounds different when you're going over a wider uh, amount of strings. Especially, especially your your fusion, your fusion, um, your fusion based solos that where you alternate between scales like like crazy, where you play like six or five scales in 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 a span yeah. of like twenty seconds. Well, I don't, I don't think so much of the scales anymore. To me, it's more of the notes. You know, it's note choice is what it comes down to. When you think about it. What makes one person different to another person's playing or what makes them stylistically, you know, a characteristic where you can recognize somebody's playing over someone else's is generally no choice. Mm -hmm. But even taking it one step further, you get out of your guitar head and yeah. contemplate how does a keyboard player, when he's listening to you as a guitar player, he knows nothing about guitar how does what you're playing, how is he hearing it? What's coming his way? The only way he or she could tell what you're doing is by the note choice and the quality of the notes, the tone to some degree, but really they're going to dig your playing or they're not, you know, they're going to dig your playing based on what you're playing. So it's uh, to a keyboard player for existence, for example, or a saxophone player, they could care less about the technique. They don't care. It's not their instrument. How you play the notes, it doesn't matter at all. You know, so uh, that's also an important thing to remember sometimes, you know, it's, it's the, note, the note choice and the musicality of your uh, expression that is what most people hear outside of the guitar world, you know. It's us as guitar players, of course, we're curious and interested in how is it done, the technique. Of course, it's important to guitar players to figure out, you know, uh, you know, if they want to study sweep picking, for example, it's, it's, it will allow them to be 
uh, better able to the, express themselves, you know, in a way. And so that's all important, but it's important only to guitar players. So, yeah, look, you know, I study music. I love music. So playing through changes is one of the, I consider improvisation to be the highest art form. Yes. Yes. Um, to be able to improvise freely through crazy changes um, or any kind of chord changes, whether they be simple or, or complex, uh, it's a, a wonderful, uh, you know, it's better than any video game for me. I, I enjoy it uh, to a great degree. It's very intellectually stimulating, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of, you know, uh, brainwave uh, analysis of what happens when a jazz musician is improvising, and it's like the the biggest fireworks display you've ever seen. And nothing comes close to delivering that kind of synapses firing in your head than an improvising musician. Yeah. Because you're basically, you're your, your, your own audience as well. You're listening, you're constantly surprised by the music, you're feeling the emotion, you're analyzing it intellectually so you can go to the next chord change and you're feeling all of that simultaneously within one second <laughs> or less, <laughs> or less. Yeah, yeah no you're manipulating your way uh, spontaneously through it, it's like weaving a, th a thread through uh, fabric you know the fabric of the music and it's a beautiful challenge to do it musically creatively uh, uh, and excitingly too you know I mean what is it I always like to talk about well what is it that draws your ear to one player over another? You know, I find that fascinating just to think about what is it that, you know, uh, someone may be drawn to my playing or, or whether it's another guitar player or a musician or Mike Brecker. What is it? I know for me, when I was listening to Mike Brecker, I had to know what the heck he was playing. I, it was so exciting to me. Uh, those notes, you know, like notes that I would never have thought of in a million years. to study and analyze and learn, you know, why is he playing those notes on this chord, you know? And understanding the chord sequence also is very important because music is extremely logical. I mean, when you have a chord, there's certain, you know, there's certain information that goes with that chord. And so you can sort of find your way as to what the person's playing They can be taking it outside too, but for the most part, there's a center, you know? Uh, and so I was really deeply into learning about harmony and which notes sound best on which chords, you know? And those are the ones you reach for when the chord changes, you know? You, you're targeting that note. You want to be on that note when the chord changes. And, and beyond, you know, whether it's arpeggiating from that point or playing whatever lick. Um, yeah, playing changes is, is, is pretty much the, the funnest part of playing uh, jazz music or any, any kind of improvised music is the funnest for me. Can you, can you describe, um, can you describe to us maybe what, what, um, How do I put it? The, the, no, the no choices that, that make the frangambale sound. What, do you have any favorite, uh, any favorite flavors, any favorite oh, colors that? Absolutely. That yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of ninths. Like uh, the ninth of a chord. If I'm on a minor, E minor seven. I like the nines a lot. Ah, and 11s. Those two notes have always been my favorites, you know? And the sixth to a degree too. So those, you know, on a minor certainly sound beautiful. And but they, on a major seven chord, A nine is beautiful too. La, 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 la. It's sweet. It's sweeter mm -hmm. than it was on a minor. But they work for both. Like, la, 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 major seven. 
la, minor, la, minor, seven, la. It's a constant note. So you learn which notes are kind of um, pedal tones that you can play through different kinds of chords. Mm -hmm. uh, a dominant chord too. La, we all love that ninth. Uh, so that's one example, you know. There's there's lots and different chords require different if it's an 11th chord for example like a g triad over a ah, i like the roots ah, you know so you you train and you learn and and you find which notes that you prefer and then you tend to go for those ones the most i mean those are a few examples but i i love I love harmony, I love chords, I like interesting chords, you know, altered chords, uh, dominant chords. You which, know? which notes would you, which notes, if you, if you saw over that, um, what is that, uh, is the um, major seven, so e, flat e nine? Seven, e seven sharp nine, basically. Sharp nine. Well, that's a melodic minor scale up a half step, you can think of it that way, it's a lot easier. There's and and which, which note which note would you choose to emphasize on such a chord? I like the sharp fives. Da, da, da. And the flat five. Da, da, da. <laughs> and the flat and sharp nines. Da, da, da. It's like a blues lick. Yeah, Pretty cool, you know, when you start discovering, hey, well, that's kind of like a blues. <laughs> Something. I'm going to ask a question just out of out of the blue, um, okay. just, just out of personal curiosity. Mm -hmm. You, when you um, when you play outside, let's say when you when you play outside, when you play um, you mean on the street, I'm kidding. Know, across the street, across, <laughs> or uh, when you uh, when you play altered scales. Um, do you, just out of curiosity, do you use the scales themselves or do you superimpose uh, different arpeggios or different, so, some, some guitar players move the, the pentatonic shape around to create the altered scale. Some, some players mm -hmm. superimpose yeah. the, the diminished chord. Um, what would- you No, know, this is a good question. And I remember asking Chick one time when I first joined the electric band, there was a tune that had just like seventh chords, you know? And I said, Chick, which, which seventh chord do you mean? Is it like dominant or is it altered? Or is it with a 13 or is it flat 13? <laughs> and he says, just choose any of those, man. You know, just have whatever you like, just go for it. And I thought, well, okay, well, uh, I see. I'm not gonna get much more than that from him because that's why he only put G7 or whatever it was. He didn't elaborate ever beyond a seventh. Mm -hmm. You know, he his charts were all major seven, minor seven, that's it. You know, maybe a try it over bass. And the substitutions and alterations were all your choice. We're all... This, you know, it's open season. He wanted the musicians to improvise and create what they heard. I mean... The melody usually was a clue, you know, if you have a seventh chord and the, and the melodies, well, then you know it's a sharp nine and a sharp five, it's, it's telling you. So, you know, the melody uh, is a very key uh, factor in determining what the composer intended for the scale. But that's not to say that you're limited to that scale. When you're improvising, you're just playing over changes a lot depends on the chord voicings that's happening under you. I like to try to come to some uh, agreement with uh, keyboard players when I'm soloing. You know, I said, when you're soloing, do whatever you want. You need to take it sideways, I don't care. Mm -hmm. But when it's my solo, I want this to be a melodic minor dominant. I don't want it to be a diminished dominant. Or I want it to be a diminished dominant, a 13 flat nine here, which is a different scale. You know, I like to determine that stuff before we we play because, you know, when I'm playing single lines, the chord really matters and the, it can make me sound wrong. Right. I, so it's important to agree 
this is the kind of altered chord I want here. And this is the kind of, you know, you, you express which kind of uh, voicing you want. Uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, look, you know, you, for yeah. me these days, uh, every note goes on every chord. <laughs> In fact, yeah. I'm writing a, a new course for my online school after so many of people have asked me, and they said, can you write a course on playing outside? Which is funny because you just asked that. And I said, okay. I always say, look, you make a lot more money as a musician playing inside. So make sure you learn to play inside first before you start taking it out. <laughs> People are going to look at you sideways going, is he just wrong or is he cool? I can't tell. You know, some people can't tell the difference. <laughs> so so you tell, us that, to, yeah. tell us more about, about the, the Franken Valley uh, online school. I, I mean, yeah. I, I, might, I might take that course on outside playing myself. Well, you know, feel free. Uh, it's a free country. Uh, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> I forget where you are. Um, so, yeah, look. Um, it's uh, a great school. I I've, I've love the idea of being able to teach freely however I want to. You know, it's mm -hmm. pretty much just a store online. You know, I create video courses And uh, you, you can go through them. I have a lot of different courses. I've got a blues course called Spicing Up the Blues, 10 hours of making blues from the start, simple, and then taking it further and further into another it's dimension, and bringing it forward. Minors and minors. Yeah, just different kinds of chords, adding certain chords, adding certain scales to it, you know, and, and just showing how to spice it up. And that's been a very popular course. My Gambali sweep picking course is probably the most popular course. It's a 10 hour, uh, you know, well, I did the that's first- That's a surprise. Who would want to learn the Gambali sweep pick technique? Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, it was a course that I wrote because I hadn't done anything since the 80s. Uh, I wrote the first book on sweeping really. And then the first video in the 80s. And I've discovered so many new things that I thought, you know, I really must bring it forward to now. And so I did uh, a, a whole lot of new things that I've discovered, plus the fundamental stuff. So it's a full, complete, everything you ever wanted to know about sweeping uh, in this course. And I've got lots, you have to go and see, I've got one on rhythmic displacement, which I find fascinating, you know. Oh, and so, wow, yeah, rhythmic displacement is amazing. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I don't want to get stuck into da 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 Those seven note and five note lines. Yeah, I do them all the time, you know, and they, to me, they're more interesting, you know, rhythmically. Um, so I did a whole course on that. I've got one called Pentatonic Heaven, <laughs> which is figuring out how to use pentatonics on everything, any kind of chord. That's a real fun course. Uh, what else have I got? Oh, God, my the, the mother of all uh, harmony courses, uh, you know, like a theory course. It's 18 hours. It was a one-year course that I wrote for the LA Music Academy mm -hmm. when I was head of that school, uh, the guitar department. It was a little private school in LA. And uh, I wrote all the curriculum. There's still quite a number of courses I wrote that I have to turn into video uh, courses. But it's 18 hours. And as I always say, it's the only theory course you'd ever need. <laughs> you know, it's got everything. It's everything. Uh, so that's that's some of the stuff that's there. Plus, there's you know this transcription stuff, and there's some some of my classic videos too up there. So, um, that's amazing. I, I I myself want to want to take some of the courses right now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Frank and Bobby I, I, Guitar I, I, School dot com. <laughs> yeah, I probably I probably will. The, the outside playing, I definitely will. The Ooh. that's that's well, kind of where I'm it's right coming. Now. Yeah, that's yeah. coming. Yeah, not ah, terrific. <laughs> so, speaking of like the more advanced concepts, um, I know that many soloists have have trouble. Um, With the outside concepts, mm -hmm. you know, they, it, it's it's different. It's difficult to get used to those sounds to because because we're so used as guitar players, we're so used to the pentatonic shape that breaking out of that 
box, the pentatonic box. Well, you don't have to. You don't have to. Move it somewhere else. Superimpose it. <laughs> you know, yeah. I can play uh, upper half step, for example. Yeah. You know. So that's just taking a pentatonic up the half step. You can take it right. up a minor third. You can take it up a flat fifth. No. The, it's really endless, you know. To me, I find that, you know, just introducing a note at a time, right, one outside note can be really fascinating as well. If I took a minor pentatonic, like E minor pentatonic, uh, or I can take the scale too, the Dorian scale, and instead of... Okay, yeah, Frank's connection... Yeah, it's like I've frozen here. Are you still receiving? Yeah, you, you were frozen oh, for a, you were frozen for a second. Here, now you're back. So introducing that flat five. So that means you go from the six to the flat five. I find that interesting. That sort of sounds outside, but not too outside. And that also gives you a triad that you don't usually have as well. If you go flat five and the sixth and then the second degree, you have an F sharp triad. So you can play that as a triad. So, you know, I've got all this stuff coming in the course, you know, because I, I, I think, you know, you have to ease into it, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of circling into notes too, like. All I did with that was I've got an E minor triad. Those are inside. You can go a half step below each of those notes. So So it's really I was just going in and out a half step below a simple triad, you know, a minor triad. Yeah. And that sounds a little bit exotic as well. Sure it does. You know, and that can really uh, create some interest. It's outside, but it's not way outside. You know, I start simple, you know, and then I get further and further out and, uh, you know, lots of other conceptual mm -hmm. ideas as well to get you moving in that direction. Uh, there's chromatic stuff too, which I really like. If you're going in E minor, if you're going from the fifth to the flat third, you can chromaticize it. Chromaticism gives you this, it, it, it leads on. You can. Then you can get fancy with it. That's whole steps in half steps. Et cetera, et cetera, you know. Actually, one, one, th one, one thing that I, that I always loved about your playing is the, the chromatics. The, the way the... Sometimes I... I don't know if I'm, if I'm imagining things, but sometimes I, I'm hearing the bebop moves. Um, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing bebop chromatics. I'm hearing the... the it's... I lost you. <laughs> hmm? uh oh Sorry. oh I like there you are sorry yeah. the bebop what I lost you there for a second <laughs> oh uh I mean I, I said I don't know if I'm imagining things but uh, when I listen to your solos I, I love the chromatics your use of chromatics it's so it's so creative uh you're blending 
a lot of what you showed me just now, what you showed us just now, but you're also very fluent in the bebop language and, and the, the, the chromatic, the, the whole circling around the notes and drawing the scale, the, uh, painting the scale using the chromatics where the scale lands on the beat. Right. Well, you know, where you land is, and where in the beat is very important too, if you're going to use that chromaticism, because you have to... You know, you're, all, you're landing on the key notes, the important notes. Uh, I'll call them important notes. As an example, you're, lear, you're landing on the dominant beats. The outside notes are on the ups and the inside ones are kind of on the down beats. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to start. So, you know. Daga, daga, daga. You know, the out notes are on the ups and the, and, you know, thinking like that helps a lot so that you, you, you resolve in, a, in an important place and in an important beat and in an, on an important note. So that kind of stuff is very important to help give your playing outside at least some continuity, some, some direction. And when you're playing, you know, when you're playing, um, in a more elaborate setting, let's say some some elaborate chord progression or anything. I mean, do you you're you're at the at the level where you can just listen and execute. But if say if say I'm a beginner or an intermediate guitar player and I'm having trouble working with changes with with the more difficult chord progressions where you have chord changes like twice a bar or how, what, always what, fun, isn't it? <laughs> it's fun, but what, where, what too what, fast. Yeah. Wow. But, but there's so much, there's so much to think about when you, when you just, well, that's your problem there. You can't think. Exactly. Yeah. So what, what would Frank Gambelli do? Well, look, I make a very clear distinction between practicing and performing mm -hmm. very different entities. Yes. Practice to me is where you have to sit down and slow th things down and figure out what you would do on, you know, two chords per bar or four chords per bar. You have mm -hmm. to learn what's important about each chord. What's, you know, I always, I'm always fascinated by just thirds and sevenths. Like I can play a whole jazz standard with just, thirds and sevenths and it's enough to hear the chord changes um, you can hear that you can hear the chords just with thirds and sevenths so I find them to be the most important in the initial stages of learning to improvise because you mm -hmm. Well, you have to learn the chord tones first. You have to know what chord it is you're actually playing on. I don't care if it's diatonic. It can be in a single key. People get a bit lazy when it's one key. Now, if I'm improvising, Now you can still hear the chords, right? Right. right. You can still hear the chords. <laughs> so when I'm on the A, to know and remember and identify each chord as it goes by and you can't skate everybody knows when, when you if you're faking it right yeah. the difference between someone who knows what they're doing and someone who doesn't is extremely clear 
-hmm. So you want to be one of the guys that knows what they're doing and thereby, you know, whether it's five chords per bar or it's, a, you know, or if it's a jazz change, like a two, five, one, you know, like this, uh, where you got this kind of movement, the hard chords, minor seven, flat five, A seven altered, D minor, B altered, you still have to know the chord tone. That's not a very good example. important thing is to really know your chord tones everywhere so if i'm learning a, a strange chord like minor seven flat five i really have to know the scale first and i need to know the chord tones so i have to be able to play them comfortably So then you can lead into each of those chord tones or lead out of those chord tones. That's the arpeggio of the chord, minus seven, flat five. The chord, the notes that are outside of the chord lead are the suspension tones and the chord tones themselves are the res resolution. So you can, cr once you know that, if I play any of the chord tones, it's pretty much inside. Uh, uh, ba, ba, ba. They all sound very inside, right? Because it's the chord. It's the chord tones. But if I play the second, da, da, do, do, da, that's the suspension. Da, and the fourth is la, da, da. They sound really cool, the notes that are not in the chord. La, da, da, do, da. Da, 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 da. That's the flat six. Da, 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 so you learn which notes, you know, I remember studying the melody for Stella by Starlight. That's a fantastic melody. And why is it a great melody and why is it memorable? You know, you, the thing about melodies, I find that is important to study because melodies, not only does it help you become more of a melodic player, which is important, but it's generally speaking, the best notes to play on those chords. Almost every chord uh, tone in that melody, I should say every note of the melody is a suspension. Be da, the 11, do da di da, the four, da di the nine, 13, do da di da, that's the fifth, that's the least interesting. That suspended on a major seven. Da, 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 seven. Da, sus, da, da, sus on a major seven. Da, 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 re. The sus again on the minor seven flat. Da, 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 sharp five. Da, da, da. Where am I? Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da
so it gets more inside as it, at, at the end there. But those tones are the best ones for those chords. And it's memorable and beautiful because of, you know, the composer, I don't remember the name of the composer, but brilliant melody for those chords and that sequence. Right. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, beautiful suspension tones. Study the melodies. They're very, it's very revealing to study the melodies. Uh, it helps you to understand uh, which are the best notes to play. Um, amen. Yes, amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, let's um, next the different topic. Uh, okay. the, the the acoustic the acoustic Frank Gambale. Ah. The, you have you. I don't know if uh, you know this. Uh, who the, the people who watch this uh but frank abali invented the tuning <laughs> yes and look i can't even demonstrate it for you because i'm in a flat you know a, a rented apartment in barcelona because i've moved to barcelona and i have all my stuff still in america waiting to be shipped over so i've been out without my guitar I've, this is the only guitar i have yeah, but we, we can we, we can just we can talk about it talk about it abstr abstractly right there's <laughs> videos and i'm going to do a little course on it as well soon because I, it's incredible i'm not just saying that because uh you know look I, i've explored a lot of tunings uh when i was younger and you know as beautiful as it is to have some open tunings like dad gad and all these, you know, open G's and open E's, uh, they're, they sound great and they're fun. But honestly, if in your heart of hearts, you're never as comfortable as you are with the standard tuning. You know, you, you can't really feel like you can improvise as freely. Sorry, mm -hmm. don't itch. That's improvise cool. as freely in those altered tunings because all the positions, all the fingerings change and that's a royal pain, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember years ago and going, look, you know, I know the chords I know. I like cluster voicings, you know. Uh, I'll play the ones I can that are easy enough on guitar and, you know, I can't do them in every key because sometimes I need an open string or just a giant stretch, giant stretch. And so I, I, I've been playing piano since I was 17. So I, I just transferred all that close chordal thing onto the keyboards as much as I felt like it. Because I've always envied the keyboard players can play any voicing and, you know, darn it, you know, I, I was envious, clearly yep. envious uh, until I discovered this Gimbali tuning. Now, you know, I'm kicking myself that it took 40 years to, to, to solve the problem. And, you know, when you think about it, if you change the octave of a string, it's still the same note, right? But it's a different octave. That alone is enough to uh, open up a whole new world to the guitar. Mm -hmm. So what I did was, uh, the, the open strings of the tuning are like the fifth fret on a capo, right? So those are my open notes, A, D, G, C, E, A. Those are the open strings, except the first two strings are an octave lower. So this, this E is actually sounds like this pitch, the second fret of the D, and the high note is the second fret of the G string. So it goes like this. Those are the open notes. But because it's just an octave change, an octave split, you can pick it up and play it immediately. All the chords that you know are the same shapes. That by itself is miraculous, if right. you ask me. Yes, right? So you don't have to, typically you would have to learn all new shapes if it was another tuning. But since it's fundamentally the same as guitar tuning, except for a couple of notes, an octave apart. So instead of a, a half step looking like, like this, right? I can play a half step from there, that G to this F sharp becomes a half step. It becomes, uh, becomes those two notes. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot easier than this. 
<laughs> so I can play, like if I play this 13th chord, it's a pretty garden variety 13. I get my favorite keyboard voicing because this is down an octave and so is this. So you get these <laughs> four notes together. I'll try and play it. Get these four notes with an A bass, right? Now you couldn't really grab that too easily or too quickly, but, but that's a real cluster of voicing where you got the thirteenth and the flat seventh and the ninth and the third right next to each other. Impossible, really, with most. I can just play it like that, like a regular thirteenth voicing. And I'm telling you, it's like, it's, it's like a brand new instrument. And I no longer have limitations to the voicings, chord voicings I can play. That statement alone is incredible. It, sound, it sounds I, incredible. I don't have any limitations. I can play any four note chord a keyboard player can play. I can even play four chromatic notes just like this. It's like, it's a bit of a stretch. Like that's a chromatic, you know, it's a stretch, but I can play four chromatic notes. Four chromatic notes would require a stretch like this, you know, it's insane. But I can play with one hand, so, right? Yeah. That's an extreme example. I can play most five note voicings and many six note voicings that a keyboard player can play that were previously, there's no other way really to play them comfortably with, with kind of standard shapes. Like this major seven is one of my favorite voicings on them because on, it's, it's these, it's the seven root three five, which sounds like my favorite keyboard. It's just a chunky chord as a one hand chord on the piano. But on guitar, you just can't play them. You just can't. And I, I can now. <laughs> well, you so, uh, it's very refreshing. It's like having a whole new, um, just a uh, universe of possibilities. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's like expanding the possibilities of sound on the guitar. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I did a record. I, did, I discovered this in 2003. So I've been uh, using it since then. Uh, people are just starting to catch on. It takes a while. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, I your... did a record called uh, Raison d'Etre. was the first uh, one that I introduced the tuning with a, a, a number of compositions uh, with the guitar. Uh, guitar chord melody kind of things with that, with that tuning. It's fantastic. I tell you, it's incredible. You use, you, you take the, uh, for the gambale tuning, you use the same, uh, you, you take the A, the A, D, G, and, uh, and B strings and just put them on. Uh... Yes, you use two different gauge sets. So mm -hmm. I'll take, a, a, say, a light and extra light set, <clears throat> and I'll take the A, D, G, and B, and I'll tune the B up a half step. That'll be the low four strings. Then I'll take from the lighter gauge, I'll take a D string and a G string. And you will tune them up to tune it up to E and A, up a whole step, both of them. Mm -hmm. And that sort of is a fairly good balance uh, of tension across the guitar. So yeah, that's that's G, that's ingenious. I can't I can't wait to try it. I you're gonna be so blown away. Yeah. You know, that's I've put it in the, I've put these guitars in the hands of a lot of incredible players. And I just like to watch the fireworks go off because, you know, <laughs> they go, oh, 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 <laughs> wow, oh, oh, you know, they just have to go and get a guitar and do it right away, you know, one of their spare guitars. And, and then they have to uh, go and get a glass of water because their, their, their whole worldview just changed. You know, I find it exciting, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it has taken a while to catch on, but I don't care. I'm using it. I'm having fun with it. You know, <laughs> uh, I think it could be another uh, standard guitar tuning uh, in the future. You know, yeah. if, if it catches on well enough. 
So it's beautiful. Check it out. Yeah, I will. I will. Uh, and the sound wise, just let's let's um, go the, go back to the uh, to the electric for a second. So, ah. Sound sound wise. Uh, I mean, because because we can't demonstrate it, so anything I ask would be abstract. Because we yeah, can... look, I don't have any of my gear. You know, I, I've got a borrow a borrowed amp, little desktop amp. A friend uh, here in Barcelona let me. Uh, <laughs> I have very rudimentary gear, which is okay because I've been, you know, still able to guitar and uh, my laptop. Yeah. I think. Sort of... I th well, I think that that if, if, even if you. If you, even if you had just one finger and one string, you'd still you'd still be able to play a lot much much better than the rest of us. So, ah, oh, well, that's very kind of you, but I doubt that's true. <laughs> I don't know. Have you ever tried to play with just one finger and see what you get? <laughs> yeah, for about three seconds, and then I go, I, I need the rest of them too. <laughs> you know, we only have four, so uh, some people use a thumb. The, the question the, that I wanted to ask was something the um, when you use the your your sweeping technique the gambali sweeping yeah you um, your position changes are mm -hmm. so are so um, effortless and you can't even hear those position changes what's what's the point behind behind that I, I must know well I'll tell you it's very simple. You know, you don't have to, if I'm playing this C note and I'm going up to this E note, like C, D, E, like this, my hand moves. I'm not holding this one. I don't have to go some crazy stretch. I don't really stretch that much because I move my hand to the notes. playground you know nobody's you play, you play. Sometimes, you play, sometimes you play sometimes you play sorry it's not terribly clean today you know you can skip around you know i was move around as you please the thing is you know i always see it like a playground or a, or a football field uh you can run skip jump hop anything you want to do but i don't i don't lock my hand in you can you know get It's called playing for a reason. We play guitar, right? We don't work guitar. We play. It's really got you got to find the joy in in the improvisation and and the exploration. Yeah. I was just playing in one key there, and, and I was, was I could hear. Yeah. Sorry, huh? What? And what? No, I, I was saying I was just saying that when you when you just play when you just played, I could I could hear in my head not only like the keyboard backing you up i could also hear <laughs> the drums oh cool yeah i could also hear the, the like the drum you're hearing the full band yeah yeah look you know uh i love to practice improvisation and i think you know a lot of it's motific you know you have to, to keep the listener you know it's really good to Repetition. You can hear a flow of ideas, one after the other after the other. And one thing leads to the next. 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think this is very important to do. And you know, you can do it anywhere. I'm not really doing anything particularly hard, other than I'm being joyful and playful. You're, you're enjoying. You're enjoying the music. Don't take it so seriously. You know, it is serious business, but, you know, remember that we play guitar. It doesn't matter if you can play fast or not. You don't have to, really. Nobody says you have to play fast. You know, take that pressure off. If it's not for you, you know, a lot of people are famous for playing slow, you know. You know, just get that note to ring. Get into the feel of it. And, you know, different kinds of bands. You got to learn all the wonderful stuff the guitar has to offer, you know, the harmonics. I love guitar, you know, it's, it's an incredibly versatile instrument. Oh. It yes. has so many possibilities, so many sounds, ways to play, you know, and it's also chords and harmony. We have, it's our... I call it the six string orchestra and that's kind of what it is, you know? Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, but we that's have a lot to learn on the instrument, you know, we have to learn the fretboard really clearly. I think it's amazing that everything's in one position. You know, all the chords are in one position. You have to know your fretboard really well if you want the freedom to be able to play uh, and express as deeply as you can. You know, and really, it's only about two feet long. Can't take that long. You have to really devote yourself to really, you know, filling in all the gaps. I remember there were parts of the neck that, you know, I didn't know it all, and I, I would avoid those those um, unpleasant areas, you know. But eventually, you have to fill in all the gaps so that you're comfortable playing. If I'm playing an E minor, it doesn't matter where I am on the neck. I got something to say in every position. You got to know it freely, you know, get, get really familiar. And I suggest you only need one or two keys. You uh, take like E and A that are far enough apart you know, take a Dorian scale of E and take A Dorian and thoroughly learn them. Don't worry about all 12 keys. You don't really need to, all, to really deeply focus on all 12, 12 keys. You know, that's a misconception. I think if you work two keys deeply, then the rest fall like dominoes. Because it's, oh, it's only a half step this way. And it's the same shape, and you know. Shapes are the shapes. We're lucky on guitar that all the shapes are the same in every key. Yeah. Can you imagine like on piano having to learn 12 fingerings for a major scale? Yeah. What a pain in the ass that would be, <laughs> I think. I mean, I know I play piano, but, you know, 
you know, e every major key is a different shape. Every Dorian key is a different shape. You know? Or that, or the, or that from bone where you have to just slide the. Oh yeah, God! I don't know how that works at all. It doesn't make any sense to me that it's <laughs> true. <laughs> uh, yeah, you get all the chicks with that one too. I tell you. Well, that's life. From bone. <laughs> well, um, so. I would like to thank you so, so much for this interview. It was insightful and fun and joyful. And um, I, I strongly suggest that uh, you watching this, watch it several times with pen and paper and write down what Mr. Gambale has to say, because he, if, if we should listen to anyone, it's Frank Gambale. <laughs> yes, and join me at my online school if you want to learn more. I've got tons of stuff there on offer. And, yes. uh, you know, it's beneficial stuff. You could go to music school and, you know, like a brick and mortar school and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or you can go to my online school and study in the comfort of your home. And, you know, I love, I love the internet in that sense, you know, because it's really... It's really made, uh, ac given us access to stuff that was really impossible before, you know? Right. So uh, be, you know, take advantage of such brilliant technology that we have now. Yes. I, I wasn't kidding. I, I, I am gonna, I am personally gonna learn the outside playing course when it comes out. Great. Yes. Sounds good. Terrific. So, um, so I, I advise everyone to follow me and go to the Frank and Valley online school. Yes, and check out the music too. You know, I've, yeah. I've done, you know, 20 solo albums and yeah. a lot of music out there. No doubt, no doubt. The, the, the solo albums, the Chicory albums. I, I, I personally love the, um, I, I have a friend who recommended, uh, he's, a, he's a Frank and Valley uh, fanatic, my friend. Uh, he, he owns all your courses, all your videos, all your books, everything. And he he uh, introduced me to the uh, collaboration that you did with um, Ma Mauricio uh, Colonna. Oh, Colonna, yeah. yeah, we did three records together. The beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's he's a wonderful classical guitar player and uh, one of the best, actually. And, oh, yeah, we toured that's for several fantastic. years and we made three albums together, and uh, it was a beautiful experience. Just two acoustic guitars, uh, or uh, sometimes I played uh, an arch top guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, mixing the two worlds, the classical and the jazz, was a beautiful uh, concept. And it was yeah. very melodic, and people loved it. It was so intimate, you know, and That's fiery, too. I mean, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of fire and passion. Yeah, in every, in, uh, yeah, in every, every note. You can hear the passion in every note there on those albums. Yeah, and I'm glad you heard those. They're good. Fantastic. Yeah. So thank you so much, so much for this well, wonderful, yeah. wonderful interview. Um, I hope you had as much fun as I did because sure, yeah. I have fun chatting away. Yeah, absolutely. Terrific. You know? Yeah, and that is incredible for this reason too. You know, you're in another part of the world, and so am I. And we can still we can chat like this as well. Yes, and uh, share it with our our public. You know, it's yes, great. Um, yes, no no doubt about that. Uh, so thanks for having me, and uh, yeah, so long. Thank you. Thank great. you so much. My pleasure.